Well, again, welcome and I uh, want to welcome our online viewers. Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope that the study tonight is a blessing to you. Uh, it's going to be a, a little bit of a unique study tonight, actually. Uh, the title is On Wings Like Eagles, and most of you are probably familiar with that title. Uh, it's a, a, a statement. It's a passage out of Isaiah chapter 40, and it may be a little bit different than what you expect uh, this study to be. Rather than just to be an exposition of Isaiah 40, 28 to 31, what I want to uh, actually deal with is uh, a, a strategy, a technique, a, a, a something that is common to Scripture. Because I want you, when you're reading your Bible and you're, and you're seeing references made, that you can understand what it is that's, that's happening. And uh, what I'm talking about here is um, how uh, oftentimes... God is given uh, unique characteristics. For example, God is given, oftentimes in Scripture, human characteristics. And the term for giving or assigning human characteristics to, to a person, in this case a God, in this case God, uh, you know, uh, the Lord God, uh, is called anthropomorphism. And the, the, the reason that that happens is because it's an effective way for readers to understand aspects of a mysterious God, a, a God beyond our, uh, our understanding in a way that makes it more understandable to us. Uh, we know that God is spirit, John 4, 24. So how is it that God could reveal himself to people in a way that humanity could at least understand him in some sense, it, which is why the majesty of Jesus is so important. Because when Philip asked to see the Father, Jesus turns to him and says what? He says, why are you asking to see the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus offers, uh, in some ways, a visual representation of who God is, the nature of God. So, you know, of course, we, we understand that Jesus, the Godhood of Jesus, is found not only in the divinity uh, wrapped up in flesh, but also the humanity that surrounds the divinity. In other words, we should equally marvel the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus. You should be equally amazed at the mystery of how God could take on flesh and, and, and also how flesh in some ways could represent and be, and be able to contain the image of God. And so I think both of those are a miracle in the incarnation. And when we look at how the Bible ascribes these characteristics to God throughout scripture, I think it helps us to understand a little bit more about who God is. Isaiah 41.10 uh, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be uh, dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's anthropomorphism. God is saying through Isaiah 41.10 that he will uphold us with his righteous right hand. So does God literally have a right hand? Or when Jesus says he sits at the right hand, of the Father, of course, there's some there's some contextual understanding that's needed there. The right hand of somebody is the premier place. To sit at the right hand of someone is to say, I hold a premier place uh, in relation to, 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 to this person. So if Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, that means that the two are one, that they both uh, sit in, in, in almost like the imagery of, of Daniel's vision, whenever Daniel has that vision and he doesn't see one, but two thrones. And it's alluding to the Godhood of Jesus who, who, uh, who stands side by side uh, God. Uh, look at Numbers chapter 6, 24 to 26, if you have your Bibles with you. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's take a look at some examples of what I mean when, when human characteristics or anthropomorphism is displayed. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. And by the way, I've got my, my uh, NIV Bible. Uh, today, partly because I just love the way it feels. So it's fine. It just feels so good. And the other reason is my, my ESP is getting so uh, highlighted and underlined and stuff. And Number 6, 24 to 26, everyone there? Tell me if you spot the anthropomorphism here. 24 to 26, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Where's the anthropomorphism there? Face. The face. 
the face of God, similar to when Moses says, I want to see your face. Now, of course, God tells him, you can't see my face. You do, you'll die. You're, 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 not, you're not capable, right? So what you see here is an ascription to the Lord that makes it more understandable that God is a personal being. So we might ask ourselves, why, why does the Bible do this? Why does it ascribe these kinds of characteristics to God? And it's because it's, it's, it's a manner that helps us understand an, uh, uh, a mysterious God. Let me give you another one. Go to Amos chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Amos is one of the minor prophets. So it's going to be towards the end of the Old Testament. Amos chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. If you don't know where Amos is, I'll help you out. It's right before Obadiah. There you go. Nobody caught that joke except you. <laughs> All right, so remember, we're keeping our eye on anthropomorphism, but not only that, but I'm going to ask you, what was the reason why the author chose to relate God in this humanistic way, right? So I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the tops of the pillars so that the thresholds shake. Bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away. None will escape. There's an impending judgment here. This isn't good news for the people receiving it. Because this is a, a rebellious people, right? This is the impending judgment. Verse 2. Though they dig down to the depths below, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to the heavens above, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from my eyes at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will keep my eye on them for harm and not for good. Whew. We always talk about God as in that big teddy bear, but we gotta we have to we have to display the true, full majesty of God, including the fact that there is judgment, that God is a righteous God and a just God. And so these are humble reminders. Do you see any uh, examples of anthropomorphism there? Did anybody catch one? So I will keep my eye on them for harm and not for good. Now, remember, the eye, the eye is, is uh, usually, of course, the human eye doesn't see 360. Wherever it's, uh, it's gazing at, that's where it's going to see. So the problem with the human eye is that there's something behind me that I cannot see. But such is not the case with God. There's nowhere that God can't see. For example, Jesus, when he's displayed, what's unique about his eyes? When you look at, like, for example, apocalyptic descriptions of him in Revelation, for example. There's flames. There's flames. What's indicative of the flames? They bore right through you. They can see. There's nothing that's hidden before him. So the eyes that are flaming describe eyes that are able to see through things. Nothing can be uh, be uh, withheld. No, the, the truth can't be withheld from, from the eyes of God, in this case, in Christ. So notice also, for example, verse 2 of Amos chapter 9. Though they dig down to the desk below, there my hand will take them. So you see this as a common way to describe God. Let me give you one more, and then I'm going to go to the bigger uh, uh, subject here. Let me read to you Ezekiel 21. And uh, verses 1 through 5. And this is going to be a unique anthro anthropomorphism. This one, you may struggle to see it. Ezekiel 21, verses 1 through 5. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Jerusalem and preach against the sanctuary. Prophesy against the land of Israel and say to her, This is what the Lord says, I am against you. I will draw my sword from its sheath and cut off from you both the righteous and the wicked. Because I am going to cut off the righteous and the wicked, my sword will be unsheathed against everyone from south to north. Then all people will know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword from its sheath. It will not return again. Anybody spot any kind of anthropomorphism there? 
No, because he's saying, set your face against Jerusalem. He's actually speaking to Ezekiel. His sword. His sword. Because God isn't literally going to take a sword and just go around. God is omnipotent. God, God is omniscient. But this is, an, this is a visual that God has given to Ezekiel. Now, in some ways, somebody could say, well, this is ascribing God using an army to come. And the sword of the enemy God will use to strike down those who have been rebellious against him. That may be the case. But in this case here, God is speaking generally in the use of the sword to strike them down as an imagery of what's awaiting them in their judgment. And so in all of these ways, God is ascribing, as God is ascribed in a way that's relatable to us. Um, and sometimes, by the way, are there any questions on any of these or comments? When you look at Acts 13, 22, God says that he found David, a man after his own what? Heart. heart. Now, that doesn't mean that God has a literal human heart, but it's speaking about his will. I found David a man who was after what I wanted. He wanted to please me. He wanted to be, he wanted to be walking in accordance with me. So we have to understand the meaning of what's being said. So here we see examples of anthropomorphisms, of anthropomorphism, where we see human qualities, including swords or, or hearts or eyes or ears or hands. And sometimes God is given animal characteristics. And that's really what I want to talk about. And that's called zoomorphism. Zoomorphism, like zoo, zoomorphism. And this can accomplish three things. Somebody might say, well, what's the difference between an animal or creature characteristic versus a human? The human is relatable. We understand that. But it can accomplish three things. Number one, it can connect God with the creation, his own creation. In other words, God is saying, through creation, you can still see me. You can still see my presence through my own creation. The second thing, it helps us understand his character through nature. So when we look at nature, it still reminds us of the God that we serve. Now, we don't confuse nature with God, but it points to God. It's, it's almost like how Paul is talking about how in Romans 12 that, that, that nature speaks to the presence and reality of God. And the third one, which we're going to focus on a little bit uh, this evening, it gives us a natural visual reminder to his character. And what I mean by that is that when God allows himself to be ascribed some sort of animal quality, like for example, uh, on the wings of an eagle. We might say, well, in what way is God uh, being compared to an eagle? But in order to understand it, we not only go to his word, he wants us to look to the eagle. He wants us to examine the eagle and to say, well, what is it about the eagle that is comparable to the image and characteristics of God? And so it's, to me, unique. It's beautiful because it's teaching us to seek God through nature in some ways. Not that we can, we can find special revelation. There's a general revelation, which is nature, and then there's special revelation through Christ, through his word. And we don't confuse the two. I'm not saying you can be saved by just walking in nature and finding God. But what I am saying is that you can look to nature and see the reminders of God, his creation, um, reminders of things that are that God puts in the world. And that's why uh, Jesus alludes to that. Look at the birds of the air. Why is Jesus doing that? He's pointing you to nature. And look at the, 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 the flowers in the field. What's he doing? He's pointing you to nature. He's saying you can look around and you can see the, the, the beauty and the majesty of my father at work in nature. And it will remind you of his character. So uh, let's take a look at a couple. Uh, go to Hosea chapter 13. Hosea chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. And I want you to give you this background before we look at the Isaiah passage for a reason. Hosea chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. This is a very clear uh, zoomorphism example. Example of zoomorphism. Uh, Everybody there, Hosea 13, 4 through 8? Amen. Amen. But I have been the Lord your God ever since you came out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of burning heat. 
When I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. I feel so bad for the Lord because it seems like consistently the, the people he loves and takes care of, they forget him, right? And we're not much different. But notice verse 7. So I will be like a lion to them, like a leopard. I will lurk by the path, like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Now we can discuss similes and metaphors. A simile is something that's similar to. Notice, I will be like a lion to them. I will be like a leopard. I will be like a bear. So there is a difference between a simile and a metaphor. But that's not the point here. We're not going to look at it uh, here um, from, a, from a narratological view. What we're looking at here is the theological point. The point is, is that God is comparing himself to lions, to, to leopards, and to bears. And in this way, not in a good setting. These are hunters. These are animals that destroy. And so he's saying, you need as, as as fearful as you are of lions and leopards as bears, you ought to be more fearful of me. I mean, you walk down the road and boy, you're afraid that there might be a lion out there. There might be a leopard out there that's going to destroy you a bear. But that's nothing compared to what I can do to you if you rebel and you don't follow my ways. So look at these other examples. Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's also called the what of God? The Lamb of God. So these are animal characteristics, right? These are uh, examples of zoomorphism. So, but you have to think of why they use them. For example, Jesus is called the Lamb of God. What's the implied attribute? What are the attributes of a lamb? Sacrifice. Meek. Meek. Quiet, like that. For example, and this I know because I grew up on a ranch. If you uh, try to kill a goat, and I'm sorry, as a kid, I had to see that. Uh, a, a goat, when it's being killed, it's going to scream and yell and fight and everything. You know what a lamb does? Nothing. It's quiet, and it allows itself to be killed. So the sacrificial lamb, there's an implication behind that. What it's saying, it's an obedient and meek creature that allows itself obediently to lay itself upon the altar or in the case of Christ to, to be crucified for the for the for the will of God it's an obedient creature that's an example um, Jesus compares himself to a mother hen in Matthew 23 37 oh how I wish I could gather you like a, a hen gathers her chicks but you would listen what animal is attributed to the Holy Spirit dove. the dove what's the implied attribute peace these are creatures that are peaceful creatures so these are examples of how God wants us to understand his nature through through um, through all of these things so uh, one of the most prominent animals and now we're getting to the good stuff here one of the most prominent animals that God is compared to is the eagle the eagle is one of the most common creatures that God compares himself to and when we examine this creature uh, we learn something amazing about the character of God and remember what I told you what's amazing about this this uh, pattern is that if I want to understand what what God means by by saying that on wings like eagles or whenever he refers to the eagle on, on the one end we can go to scripture and we can study it but on the other end I think that there's an implication that God wants us to learn about the animal so that we can more appreciate why God compares himself to that creature so let's, uh, with that being said, let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. Let's go to the next slide, Bonnie. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. Whoever wants to read that. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. Amen. So, 
There's actually several passages that we're going to look at that make references to eagles. And this is probably one of the most well-known. And in each one of these passages, there's characteristics about the eagle that are attributed to God. Notice here that God tells the Israelites that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. So we're looking at weakness uh, turning to strength. There's a, there's a, there's a provision of, of strength being given to people, right? It says they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So the idea here is that God will bless the faithful with supernatural strength. And I can relate to that. There are times when, you know, there's people that have asked me, how in the world did you do all this stuff? Like when you were working on your dissertation, how in the world did you do all the things? You were doing? I, I, I don't know. I soared on wings like eagles, I guess. God gave me the strength to get through what I needed to do. And a lot of us to relate to that. Have you ever been in a moment of, uh, in your life when you go, I have no idea how I got through it. I have no idea. I had all of this on my plate. Um, maybe a loved one passed away. Uh, and then you had this sickness or you had this issue or this problem and then this happened and that happened all of a sudden when it rains it pours you're like Lord I have no idea how to do all this and this speaks to that it says in those moments for those even youth grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength and what I love about it is it's saying the, the young people the people who supposedly have all this energy they get, they, they get tired and weak but if you hope in the Lord I'm going to renew your strength and then he, he directly links it to the idea of the eagle. But what does the eagle have to do with this? Well, there's several points. Again, remember, we look at the scriptures and we read them. But when we look to the eagle, we see some interesting things. For example, did you know that there was an ancient tradition that the eagle grew its feathers every 10 years for 100 years? In the ancient world, they believed that the eagle lived to be over 100 years old and that every 10 years it grew new feathers. Now, realistically, they do. Uh, feathers, uh, the, the eagle grows uh, new feathers. Now, Kayla's a bird lover. So what do you call it? What's the, what's the, what is it? Molting. And so, I, I mean, I'll look at her bird cage and there's feathers everywhere and she'll say, oh, well, the birds are molting. I said, well, what's that? Well, they're growing new feathers. It's not like, it's not like uh, uh, they have the same feathers for, for their entire life. So there's this process of it, right? So let me read to you Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. You don't have to go there. But let me give you the indication of what it means that uh, God is speaking here in Isaiah. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with the love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise God. Isn't it amazing when we really think about the majesty of God that's being said here? But whenever he describes himself so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, it's speaking to this characteristic of, of the eagle. When they would see the eagle, they saw the creature that was constantly being being renewed every day. It was almost like a new creature. And they would look to the, to the eagle and says, it doesn't matter if it's 50 years old, that, that eagle looks as good as new. Because you didn't look at, at an eagle like a, you know like an old buzzard. It was like, oh, it's an old eagle and its, and it's uh, uh, feathers are all messed up and, and crooked and everything. And it's, you know, no, the eagle is renewed. So no matter what age it is, it still looks mighty and strong. And that's what the image was here that was being shared in Isaiah. Here's another uh, stat. Eagles are known for their stamina. Do you know that they can fly over 10,000 feet? And fly as high as the, 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 the airplanes that we take. And that they're known to fly as long as 225 miles in one day. So when we look at these other passages that reference the eagles, we find that there's a beautiful imagery of how God relates to his children. Let me give you an example. Go to the next slide, buddy. Go with me to Job chapter 39, verses 27 to 30. I know we're doing a lot of Bible, but that's good. You need some exercise, biblical exercise here. <laughs> when God responds to Job, who is asking him, Why, Lord, why have you done all these things? 
Why did you do all these bad things to me? Are you, why are you such a mean God? You know, He's whining. He's complaining. And then God says, all right, I'm going to question you now. You brace yourself. You answer it since you're, you're so good at asking questions. So he begins to lay out in chapter uh, 39 through 40 and 41 just a series of questions that just continues to humble him and reveal to him that he's not God. And he's re really not in a position to question God. And through this discourse, and at the end of chapter 39, this is God asking Job this question. Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its stronghold. From there it looks for food. Its eyes detect it from afar. Its young ones feast on blood. And where the slain are, there it is. I want you to notice, does the eagle soar at your command? No. You know whose command the eagle soars? God's. And so God is showing Job that there's not a creature that doesn't escape its sight, uh, his sight. And that there's not a single part of his creation that he is not intimately connected to. And so even here in Job, we see relatable attributes of the character of God. It builds its nest on high. In other words, it builds its nest in the heavens. Who is in the heavens but God? It dwells on a cliff, a rocky stronghold. The Lord is my rock. Its eyes detect from afar. Did you know an eagle's eyesight is eight times more powerful than a human's? And that they can see up to over half a mile away. They can be flying and they can see over half a mile. Some people say even up to a mile away to see prey. And when it's able to attack you. Well, who else? Who's other? Whose ways are higher than our ways? The Lord's. You see, so this 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 idea, right? It's a mighty hunter, strong and dominant. In other words, the, the, the eagle is the king of the sky. But who is the king of the heavens? God. Our God is the king of the heavens. Our God sees all things. He sits, he sits in the majesty in the heavens on high, and there's nothing that escapes his sight. This is the character of God that he's explaining here in Job chapter 39. So one of the characteristics of the eagle is uh, that he's the king of the sky. Let's go to that last slide there, buddy, if you can. Now, go with me. This is probably the key one that I want to look at. Uh, next slide, and then the next slide after that. That one, yeah. Go to Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 through 4. Exodus chapter, did I say 9 or 19? 19. 19. Exodus 19. Verses 3 through 4. If somebody would read that, please. Amen. Isaiah, thank you. That took a lot of courage. You good, I man. Five. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, amen. So what you see here is Moses speaking to God, and God instructed him to say this to them. And I want you to notice the last statement. I want you to tell them to remember what I did for them in Egypt and how I carried them on eagles' wings and brought them to myself. Remember what I told you. God oftentimes is pointing to these creatures as indicative of what does that mean? Like, for example, when he makes references to the vineyard. Well, if you're not familiar with vineyards, you may struggle to understand the analogy. Uh, in this case here, he's making a reference to eagles. Well, if you know nothing of eagles, you're going to struggle to make this analogy. I want you to notice the image that you see. Oh, Marty, can we put it on that last, <laughs> that last slide there?
I want you to look at this image that's on that last slide. And that image is telling you. What do you think is on the eagle's wings? It's baby, it's a mother eagle. It's a mother eagle. And when God says, I want you to tell them, Moses, to remind them how I carried them on eagles' wings and brought them to myself. I want to read to you Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 to 12. You don't have to go there. You can if you want. But I'm going to read to you Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 to 12. In a desert land, he found him in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. The Lord alone led him. No foreign God was with him. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, and spreads its wings to catch them and carries them along. There was no other God like God. Did you know that when it's time for a mother eagle's youngs to fly, it does three things. Number one, it stirs up the nest. Did you know that? The way it stirs up the nest is it goes up to the nest, the beautiful little nest that he's made, and begins to break the little twigs and pull them out so that they're jutting out like little needles to poke on the baby chicks. You know why? Because they're comfortable in that nest. They're real. I mean, it's groovy, man. All they need is a flat screen TV, and man, they, they're good. They don't need to go anywhere. Give them a Uber Eats, and man, they'll never leave. <laughs> you break those twigs and you pull them up. All of a sudden, they're no longer comfortable in the setting that they've been in. But it. But the mother eagle does this because it's time for the baby chicks to leave the nest, and so deliberately she stirs up the nest to make it uncomfortable. To let them know, uh-uh, you, I did, I did not make you. I did not create you to lay around on a nest. I created you to fly. I created you to soar. The second thing the eagle nest will do, I mean, the eagle, a mother eagle will do, is hover over its young, just like Deuteronomy says. Once she breaks up the nest, she comes up and she hovers over the nest, and she's spurring them on. Watch me. Watch what I do. Now you do it. The third thing she does is she encourages them to get up on the edge of the nest. And it must be scary for those baby chicks to get up there and decide they're going to take that leap of faith and go out there to try to fly. And those little birds jump off the, uh, if they're brave enough, right? If not, she'll nudge them off. And they'll jump off. And as soon as they jump off, the reason she's hovering over the nest is to let them know it's okay. I'm with you. I will be with you wherever you go. And when you take this leap of faith, you will not be alone. I will be with you. They jump off and the mother flies down with them and she's watching them. And that bird's trying to flap its wings. And one of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to take off and fly or it's not going to be able to take off and fly for which the mother at the last moment will swoop underneath and catch it on its wings and bring it back up and save it. Ensuring that that baby does not hit the ground. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and ho hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. The Lord alone led him. No foreign god was with him. And the point is this, and I think you've caught up, with, caught up to it. When God ascribes himself and this uh, zoomorphic quality of being like an eagle, if you don't study and look to what the eagle does, you can't understand and appreciate what God is saying about his character. He's saying, there's going to be times when I'm going to rustle up your nest. There's going to be times whenever you, you don't like what God is doing, and you're going to look up and say, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Why are you breaking all the twigs? I'm really comfortable here. This is nice. But God is saying, I didn't create you to sit there in that little nest. I didn't make you to sit there. I made you to soar. I made you to fly. I made you to take off in your wings. Then God will always assure you in his presence. And when you're afraid, you'll say to yourself, you'll remember what scripture says to you. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And 
And then when you take that leap of faith, you remember what God finally says. Don't worry. I'm with you. You won't hit the ground. If I commissioned you to go, you won't fail. And when you feel like you can't do it, I will gather you up. I will take you on the wings like an eagle, and I will carry you aloft. So when you feel like you can't go anymore, you're going to feel like that little bird right there. I'm flying. And what you don't know is you're actually on the wings of God leading you to where you need to go. This is a reminder of the character of God. And when we understand it from the from the aspect of the nature of the eagle, it makes sense to us. Questions, comments? Aaron? I was just going to say, uh, this whole image uh, reminds me of of when we still flew the space shuttle, how we would put the space shuttle on top of a 747, a Boeing 747, and the 747 would fly the space shuttle to the place where the shuttle was going to, to take off from. You remember those images? Yes. So what I'm thinking is that, uh, not just the eagle, probably birds, all birds, but since God chooses the eagle for these reasons, the eagle probably has a very keen understanding of, of air, of the capacity of air to hold, not just to hold the eagle up, but to do what it has to do for her, her chicks, you know, for, for her birds. Yeah. So she has her own strength that she has a knowledge of, of the world around her that will sustain her and enable her to do what she does to help her chicks to fly. Amen. Uh, yeah. I mean, when when I used to see pictures of of the 747 with that space shuttle up on top of it, I used to think, man, how is that thing even going to get off the ground? Right? I mean, that space shuttle looked like a a, a big cigar on top of the, the yeah. 747. If you remember the image, I do. And yet, it does. Yes, it does. Right. And so. Uh, Eagles are pretty powerful birds. Yeah, and you know, and, and that's a good point because there are birds that can soar higher. I mean, I was in doing some of this research. There's a buzzer that can go that they they've actually uh, measured it to be close to thirty thousand feet, it's like a buzzard or something. A what? An albatross. An albatross. Thank you. Uh, so there's this unique bird that can fly higher than the eagle. Uh, that's been noted. There's uh, birds that can fly longer than the eagle. I mean, the eagle has been calculated to fly over 225 miles in a day, but there's birds that have flown more than that. But what I, the reason I think that God selects the eagle as the imagery is for me twofold. Number one, it's the king of the sky. But number two, it's unique qualities towards its young. It's so unique in the way it treats its young, the way it protects its young, the way it hovers over its young, the way it, and what it tells me is that part of God's creation, the way God created things, they weren't just random animals here and there. They weren't just random creations. He didn't just create trees because he thought they might look good. Everything that God has made serves as a constant visual reminder of his majesty and his glory for us. That wherever we look, we can look to it and say, how do I see God in that? How do I see God in the things that we see? And when we begin to understand everything is subject to the, the creation of God, his creative hand, we begin to see the imprint of God in everything that we see, but only for those who have eyes to see. For, for the scientists, they just see random acts. They see, oh, this is just a result of millions of years of evolution or whatever. But we have to, we have, to have eyes to see better than that. We have to have the understanding that this, all this stuff didn't come here by random. And when you look at the behavior of, of creatures and animals and the things that they do, there's something beautiful to be seen about that. And so, for example, and, and, and I know that you were wanting to share something too, but, um, but for example, um, uh, Charles Darwin and this whole idea of the, of the theory of evolution, what he claimed was that the primary thing, the number one thing that drove any creature, any living thing, was uh, was self-preservation. That it's an innate nature that in the face of danger, in the face of threat, whatever, it's the, it's instinctive that it wants to preserve itself. But what do we see uh, mothers and, and, and parents do? And not just for humans, I mean for, for all creatures, but sacrifice themselves often. There's a video, I may have shown it here, a video of a, 
of a mother antelope jumping in front, sees her young trying to cross the river, sees the alligator coming, and or the crocodile, and jumps in front and sacrifices herself for her young. That's that's completely that flies in the face of what what uh, Darwin's theory would have been. So there's examples in which we see that God is showing us self-sacrifice in, 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 in the world and creatures and in, in the king, animal kingdom as much as in, in humanity. And it's a reminder to who he is. It speaks to that. Pastor, what you said just a while ago stuck really with me when you said that when the mother pushes the eagles, the, the eaglets, you know, to the edge and 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 they they understand what they are and how, you know, I think that as believers, when God does that, we need to understand who we are. And we have a father who's teaching us how to live our lives. He's holding us up. He, he's, but, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy. And so I think, you know, I guess he could, we could have been chickens. The chickens don't fly. Yeah. You know, he chose the eagle to present himself as an eagle. You know, uh, we have to understand that's a, uh, I'm glad you said that because that's my whole point I just uh, this lesson isn't about eagles you understand right first of all it's about understanding right. how to read God's word right. and it's about how, how God is using that imagery to remind us who we are so thank you so much Virginia because we're not going to find out who we are and we're not going to become who we need to be by staying in the nest we're going to we're gonna have to jump off and that's going to be very scary but God is there hovering saying I'm right here man I got you did you know, true fact, there was an eagle. You can look it up. There was an eagle. Uh, uh, I don't know how the egg ended up, but there was a farmer that found the egg and and put and took, took it to his uh, chicken group. How many of you have heard the story? It, it, do I? He incubated it? Yes. So this, far, uh, this farmer, rancher, incubated this egg that he found, was, which was an eagle egg, right? Then he raised it with his chickens. So when it was born, he kept it with his chickens. Guess what? They thought it was a chicken. It's exactly your point. And this eagle didn't fly because it looked around and he didn't see anybody else flying. So it looked around and says, this is who I am. This is what I am. And that's what happens to us in the world. We're surrounded by people who tell us what we can or can't do. And all the while God is saying, no, I'm saying you're something whole other than this. And we're surrounded by negative influences. We're surrounded by the world. And this world is, is trying to tell us who we are. And, and all of it is a lie. And it's telling girls, yeah, you can be a boy and boys can be a girl. And then they're confused. And they wonder why they're confused because the world is telling them something that God says, I created you that, like this. This is who I created you to be. No wonder you're confused. You're trying to affirm yourself. Think about it this way. This is just a simple example. Um, would you be confused by me if I got up here and says, hi, my name is Ernie Valdez and I am a heterosexual. I identify as a heterosexual. Uh, you know, that's that's how how I I am and that's who I am. Dude, the, what are you talking about? Is that is that all you are? A heterosexual? Aren't you a father and and, 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 and a husband and a pastor and, and a businessman? That's you're limiting yourself to, to your sexual preference. That's your identity. But isn't that what the LGBTQ does? Hi, my name is so and so and I'm a uh, whatever uh, yeah some uh, yeah, I, I can't even know. I don't even know all the words. Like pronouns are. Yeah, I'm I'm trans this or I'm uh, meta this or whatever. Really? So you are reducing yourself to just that. But that's that's what happens when the world tells you what you are. You're an eagle, and the world's telling you you're a chicken. And all the while you can fly. And so I really appreciate Virginia's comment on that. But I was just gonna make a comment. I really also love the fact. Of the imagery when you read the word how god refers to the saved as sheep and the lost as goats i mean that's that's and in matthew was it in matthew when when he talks about he's going to come and separate the sheep on the right those are the saved and the lost are the goats on the left amen i don't know anyone who wants to be a goat right right well Unless you be the greatest of all time, right? But that's a different goal. But but you're right. Now think about what you're just saying. Think about what you just said. Is this world's definition of beauty different than God's? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So you get these Vogue magazines or whatever, Cosmopolitan mag magazines. They got these girls on there. They got their makeup and they got their Photoshop and everything. And that image is not real. But the young girls that look at it, they think, well, that's what beauty is. And all the while, God says, my girl, you are beautifully, wonderfully made in my image. And these girls are raised in a culture where they think that you have to look a certain way. You have to, you know, have this image and so forth. And that all of that is a lie. The truth is, is that what God looks at is the heart, the character of the person. And one thing I've tried to do as, as, a, as a father is to remind my kids, you can be as good looking on the outside as you want to be. But at the end of the day, that's not going to save you. That's not going to lead to anything productive in your life. You better worry about the character. Because God is not interested in your comfort. He's interested in your character. And for those who really, if you look biblically, the people who have soared like wings on eagles, it was those who focused on what God really focused on. He says, this is my definition of beauty. This is what my definition is of, of character. This is what I see as wholesome. This is holy. This is pure. This is what I see as good. So our, and our job as parents is to teach our kids that. Say, so don't, don't listen to what the world says. Don't listen to what the world says about what is good, what is bad, what is, because just like scripture says, this world has now flipped it into called evil good and good evil. It's all flipped on its head. Angela, I never got a chance to give you. Oh, okay. you know, no, I just had a quick question. It was, <clears throat> we talked about anthropomorphism and zoomorphism. Is there one related to food too, like a type of morphism, like the fruit of the spirit or like, you know, the Bible's referred to as the I got to answer that one. You need to see the veggie tails. I think I think the, the the zoomorphism and the anthropomorphism are the only two that really people work because because they're living things that 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 display certain characteristics. Now, God is attributed to a strong tower, a rock, a vine. A vine. Yes. So we'll see God, com uh, you know, compared to to uh, objects and things like that, but. <clears throat> But in there, in my opinion, I may be completely wrong, but in there, I feel like the definitions are self-evident. Like, you know, the, the stone, the mighty tower, the strong tower, uh, completely contrasts the, the, the sand like Jesus talks about, the, or the, the, the things that are shifting that are not stable. So, so to me, where I think that there's a lot, of, and, and again, you may have some scholar that comes up and says, oh no, let me show you the things to which God described himself that we can see a lot of beauty that maybe we don't see on the surface. But but I think to me, uh, especially in the Old Testament, the, the connection that uh, animals, animal connections is, is, is telling. Uh, because we observe their behavior. Now, of course, like if God calls himself a strong tower, that makes sense. I mean, you have this, this, this city, and then you look to the hill, and there it is, that strong mm -hmm. tower, it's that defensive tower. And somebody thinks, I'm glad that's there because there's somebody posted there. And if there's attackers, I feel safe knowing that somebody's going to be there to watch over me. So there's this imagery there that's given. Um, but, um, that's a good question. yeah, like living water, so forth. Um, creation is divided up into three areas, uh, mineral, vegetable, and animal. Those are the three. You can't be anything other than that. And, 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 in the, and in the Bible, the Lord uses all three of those spheres of creation to manifest aspects of his glory and his power and his character. Amen. That's, so that's all three of them. Amen. Yeah. You know, when you look at, for example, minerals, we see silver and gold. We well, see mineral would be rocks, including it, yeah, the, rock. the whole material, yeah. physical material. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. Thank you, brother. I didn't. Brother, you had a point you were going to make, and I didn't give you a chance to finish. You probably forgot my number. Well, I was just wondering, how fly, how high can an eagle fly before it it, it lacks oxygen? Well, <laughs> and actually, how, and how high can a man go before he needs oxygen? Yeah. So, so I know that I read a little bit on this that at ten thousand feet, the uh, from after that the air gets so thin and, the, and cold it gets dangerous, especially like ice forming. But that bird, the albatross or whatever that Kato's talking about, that it's it's got it's it's got some sort of uh, uh, adaptation uh, adaptation in its lungs that it's able to fly hard. So but, the reason I ask those questions is because God has created something unique and different in every creature. In the eagles, He makes them fly as high as they can. So should we be going up there? 
but we have to put face masks on our face <coughs> to, to breathe. Do we have any business being up there? Can I answer the question? Uh, if you follow, if you follow that logic, we shouldn't do anything other than just walk and run. Because why should we drive a car that gets us going 50, 60 miles an hour when we ourselves can't go that fast? Yeah. So let's get rid of automobiles. Let's get rid of anything Scuba diving. that enhances our ability to. to yeah, get around in the I would world. go with horses. I'm good with horses. <laughs> Uh, what, gonna, what, what, you're going to have to learn to ride a horse. Because I can do come, that. We're going to come back with a lower in the horses. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I think you could put. I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take it. I agree with Rudy. I, I wouldn't take it. Uh, uh, at, you know, directly like that. But you could put a theological spin to that and say that that the uh, ego knows its limits, knows where it should and shouldn't go, and so forth. Uh, and it, 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 the ego is not going to be foolish enough to go down and just walk around in the forest that knows its places in the sky, it's effective where it needs to be, and so that we should be too. I think that's a good a good way to maybe look at it that yeah, way. I remember, I remember this guy told to uh, uh, Joe MacArthur, he, said, he told Joe MacArthur, he said, you know, I can go right down, right now, this month, on the middle of the highway, and nothing gonna happen to me. <laughs> Your mom got to the oh yeah, you're gonna be smashed. We say go oh, you, but you were thinking that Lord is gonna protect him, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah that's 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 give us, give us the, the permission to act foolish, right? But I just want to mention you, you made that comment. Out. I read this was a this has been years ago. I read somewhere where an eagle actually at, it comes to a point in its life where um, the talons they, they're starting to loosen, the beak is. Soul, things like that, right? And for it to continue to survive because it needs to have those to survive, right? To catch its prey, it will actually find uh, like a cave or somewhere and it will go in there and it will literally pluck its feathers from its body. And I don't, I mean, it's like some long time, but I mean, it's in there and it's safe, but I mean, it's plucking itself so that new feathers come out um, and it does something, I think, like it, it'll break its beak on the rock intentionally so that a new one, yeah, sharper, a new, sharper, sharper one will grow. Mm-hmm. Same thing with talons. So it, the bird knows, like you're saying, it, I mean, it knows itself. It knows what it needs. Well, I, I, the, I love those those points because you might say, well, what's the point of this lesson? Of course, I want to introduce you to anthropomorphism, I want you to the, zo- uh, the zoomorphism in the, in the Bible so you can understand it better. But to the greater point of that, when we examine how God connects himself to the characteristics of the eagle, we find three beautiful points. As the eagle uh, breaks up the nest, stirs up the nest, as the eagle hovers over her her, her babies, and as the eagle um, uh, takes her, her, her babes on, on the wings of eagles, so God does that for us. And, and it's a reminder to us that we have a God who loves us. And and, and what I love about that is we always, we always look at the... the, the, the the masculine at- attributes of God, but God does take on uh, some of the feminine attributes too, to, to glorify that aspect. And, and and this is one of those that I would see. This is the mother eagle, and and God ascribes this characteristic to, to his nature. So uh, because it, it, we would be foolish to think that God only takes a masculine uh, a masculine uh, 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 imagery in his in his uh, revelation to his people, and so we see both their reveal. Yeah, and did you say it earlier too? Yeah. The about the hen taking care of the chicks. Yes, like a mother hen gathers her chicks. That's right. So, so uh, a, a, a God is not hesitant to do that to show us that the the beauty of mothers. And of course, that could, I, that could have been my Mother's Day sermon right there. <laughs> <laughs> next year. Uh, yeah, the next year because because they're, they're and so what's the message there? There's no love like a mother. There's no love like a mother, and God loves us in, in that same fashion. Well, that's about that time that wraps up the lesson. Uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, input. And let's keep praying for those people who are in need. Keep praying for, uh, especially for those who are ill, dealing with some serious issues in their life. Uh, And um, the last thing I'll say is I want to remind the kids, remember, the world may say one thing about you, but but God says something totally different. You are beautifully, wonderfully made. Parents, remind your kids how beautiful they are. And what makes them beautiful is what God sees in their hearts. Let's go to the Lord. <coughs> Father, thank you uh, for this study, this message, and for this just a great dialogue. 
Lord, your word is truth. Your word is eternal. And it's an a everlasting reminder of your love for your people. Lord, as, uh, as you uh, display here through the eagle, Lord, you remind us that there, there's going to be times when you're going to make us uncomfortable, but always for a purpose and always in love. That you're going to remind us that you're there with us, Lord, no matter where we walk. And most importantly, you remind us that no matter what happens, you will always be there to to uh, to, to pick us up and to guide us in, in, in our path, Lord. So that even when we're falling, we know that we, that we have you to lift us up. So wherever we are in our lives at this point, Lord Father, may we always remember that that promise is eternal in you. And so, Lord Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the study. And I pray that you be with us and bless us this week. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.